Okay, if we can we make a start with the, the final session? Congratulations for making it to the end. This is a session where I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun. Um, and I think you're all waiting in anticipation to see what's gone wrong to it. Now, the first speaker you will know very, very well. Um, unfortunately, he's not here, but he has sent a hologram. <laughs> so, he's, he's actually recorded all of this for you, so he can tell you about his complication. So it's Professor Heinz Stamberger, who had to go back to Graz very urgently. Um, so can we, can we start the video, please? Hello, Andrew, dear co-panelists, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first apologize that I can't be here speaking to you in person, but for a variety of reasons, I had to go home uh, um, already right now. The case I would like to share with you, a case I prayed I never would have been involved in, does not require any slides nor videos, though I do have a video of this, but for reasons I'm sure you will understand soon, I will not show. The event happened somewhere in the late 90s when at Graz we had just started to do pituitaries transnasally under endoscopic guidance together with our neurosurgeons. And at that time I used to travel a lot, attend courses abroad, and even do life surgery there. And on one of those meetings abroad, I lectured, I did surgery, amongst other things, repaired a CSF leak that the last visiting professor had left behind in a patient. And then I presented our initial experience for hand surgery for pituitaries together with our neurosurgeons. After that, I was approached by a local neurosurgeon of the hospital where this course was being held, saying, oh, that's great, he has a, a, a pituitary patient scheduled, couldn't we do it together under endoscopic guidance? He would be happy to operate together with me. And I said, well, why not? Such it happened. The next day, Ah, uh, the patient was uh, anesthetized. I opened the way to the sphenoid, not a big issue. Opened the floor of the cella, incised the dura, but then the neurosurgical colleague asked me to extend the bone opening into the planum sphenoidale because he would love to look above the pituitary. That's what he was used from his approaches, whatever. So I did, I resected more bone of the planum sphenoidale, a large opening opened the dura, and there was a strange situation encountered. Today, I would have known better. Then, I had never seen a prefixed chiasm pushed forward and downward by a large uh, pituitary adenoma, nor had apparently the neurosurgeon. But I was just holding the endoscope, and the chiasm was totally flattened out and obscured the vision. The neurosurgeon who was manipulating then was very rude to the structure which he didn't recognize as such, nor had I recognized it, pushing it up and down, tearing it in from the left to the right, and finally, not being sure what that was, took a pair of scissors and started to cut on it, and that was the moment when on the video you can hear my tiny voice. Sir, are you sure that this is not the optic nerve? And it was. But he wasn't sure. I wasn't dead sure. So he stopped working on that, bypassed it by rudely pushing it up and again to the adenoma, which then was removed one way or the other. I closed the defect, the CSF leak, etc. That was way before the Haddad flaps, okay? But I felt awfully bad for the situation that I was involved in. After the patient woke up from anesthesia, 
he had almost no visual acuity, visual field was massively diminished, he was sort of blind, and that worsened over the next day, as long as I was still in that country. Then I flew back. A couple of weeks later, when I investigated about the well-being or the process of that patient, I heard that he had gone totally blind and finally he had committed suicide because he was living alone and could not find a way around for his living any longer anymore. I did not feel guilty for having done anything wrong with my surgery, my instruments, my endoscopes, but I was involved and trapped in a procedure, in a team approach, which turned a patient completely blind and finally made this person commit suicide in an iatrogenic damage. Should I have at least voiced out louder to the neurosurgical colleague, but I wasn't sure of what I was seeing. I had a gut feeling. The big neurosurgeons, the tiny rhinologists, who was I then? Should I at least later have talked to the patient, sent him a mail, talked to the relatives? It is a strange mixture of guilt, of not having avoided something I could have avoided by being more pronounced about my uncertainty and the potential wrongdoing of my then neurosurgical partner. It is a process which more than other situations where I wasn't as good as surgery and something didn't work perfectly and I could have done better, which is still haunting me up to today, almost 25 years later. Discuss such a situation and if there is anything that I possibly could pass on from that, it is think twice before you engage in life surgery at an environment which isn't your own, where you know if something goes wrong, fascia lata to harvest takes me five minutes, fibrin glue is over there, etc. The nurses know what to do because the next day you will sit in the plane and wave goodbye. And you're not waving goodbye only to a partner you had not known well before, his or her abilities, you're waving hello and goodbye to a patient that you simply had to leave behind. Doing surgery, demonstrating thing might improve your ego, but that was a classical case where it did not. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, that was a chilling start. Um, <laughs> I hope we'll leave this room all feeling happy at the end of the day. <laughs> I will do my best. But Heinz is right that we carry these things with us and sometimes it, it's, it's nice to go to another unit and, and um, display your skills and contribute to the team but if it goes wrong, you, you carry that with you. And as doctors, because we care about what we do and we have passion for what we do, we never ever fully recover. But we can always pass the advice on so that it'll keep other people out of trouble. So, Fitzger, would you like to come and give your presentation now? So Professor Falkins is going to tell us her confessional story. Thank you, Andrew. I don't have slides either, because there's nothing to see. 
that a lot happened. And just like Heinz's case, it was also a maturity. It was around 1995, and I work, worked in Rotterdam, and there the neurosurgeons were still doing their pituitaries microscopically. And they always did that on Thursday morning, and the anesthesist started at 8 o'clock, and the neurosurgeon wheeled in the microscope at nine o'clock sharp because he had to go to his uh, outpatient clinic at 12.30 sharp because that was in another hospital and they had to start there at one o'clock. So there was always a little pressure and sometimes a lot of pressure to be in time. Because if I, as the ENT surgeon, did not open the pituitary or the sphenoid in time, so that was before nine sharp, um, he would be very upset. So that day, the anesthetist uh, had a little problems with getting the patient asleep. The nurses were slow. I was tired, and um, at, it was 20 to 9 before I could start my procedure. We were used to have lidocaine and cocaine, both on a little table to infiltrate the septum and put some cotonoids with cocaine in the nose of the patient. I was um, sort of pushing everybody around me to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, because I have to open this patient. In, in, by then, I thought I would have eight minutes, and it started to get less and less. And there were two bottles on that little table. One contained lidocaine, one contained cocaine. The cocaine was stained pink to help me to see what was the right bottle. I poured both bottles in little containers because that was easier to pull out the lidocaine in the syringe and to put the cotonoids in the other one to put in the nose. By a moment of uh, not taking care, but which of course happened because I felt so stressed, and that was one of the learning points from this case, I pu pushed the syringe in the um, pink solution, which contained 10% cocaine, and injected the septum of the patient. And while I put the needle in, I heard the pulse of the patient going from something like that. And at that moment, I realized what I did. And there are a lot of angels on my shoulders because it was a young girl of, or young lady of 31 years old. She had a tension of 250 over 180. She had a pulse of far over 200, and um, I had a great neuroanesthetist who kept her alive. Uh, and she survived the whole thing without um, any serious damage. But would that have been a normal pituitary patient of, say, 60 years old with uh, a heart a little bit less strong or vessels in the brain a little bit less strong, for sure the patient wouldn't have survived it. So what did I learn from this case? Whatever happens, how stressed I am, whoever in my surroundings tells me to hurry up, the patient comes first and everybody has to wait till we are ready. It was a terrible, terrible experience. I. Um, 
I told it um, in my own department. We went together to the neurosurgical department to tell what happened, to learn from it together. But I hope I, I, it's something I will never do again. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, it must also have been over 200. It was, it was really, really terrible. You know, the sinking feeling, the moment you hear that going up and you look at that syringe and think, oh no, oh please, no, it's, it was, was awful, it was awful. And the, the feeling, oh my goodness, I killed her. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I think you're all stunned into silence. <laughs> um, the next speaker is one of my great friends, Paul White, who's come from Dundee, previous president of the British Rhinological Society. And Paul has stepped in very kindly at the last minute. So, Paul, if you'd like to take the show. Uh, that sneaks us up. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I had so many cases that uh, there was plenty to choose from, and I noticed these cases were from the 1990s. Uh, my case is much more recent, and I think is maybe a lesson, well, to me and maybe others of you who are aging a bit, that there is still an issue of experienced pilot era, and there's always something to learn. Uh, from your patients. I, in my practice, have a, a large number of patients referred to me for orbital decompression. A number of them are, are cosmetic because we have a very strong ophthalmology department uh, with um, the professor of ophthalmology who has just completed a term as president of the ophthalmology college and has a particular interest in thyroid eye disease. Uh, so from 1995, I've been doing decompressions uh, much in, in a similar way to Hashim Sali, who I don't know if any of you saw his presentation yesterday, but pretty much the same uh, methodology of medial wall for cosmetics like this. Um, and young patients expecting to get good results, knowing that the stakes are high. Uh, but these patients tend to be otherwise fit and well, and the surgery is usually a pleasure to perform. It's not like your standard fist case. They don't bleed. And the recovery afterwards is usually pretty straightforward. Of course, we're drilled in potential orbital complications. Um, the main one for these cases being diplopia, and uh, up to 25% of them will get some transient diplopia. Um, if you, in the early days, we had one or two patients who, who had epiphora, but we overcame that by making sure that we decompressed the lacrimal sac as well at the same time. And then pretty much it's, it's as for endoscopic sinus surgery, and we have all of the um, uh, rehearsals for what we do for a patient who has a CSF leak or um, has an intraoperative uh, hemorrhage. So I'm now going to just briefly describe the case. Of course, you won't be able to read that. This is the referral from Professor McEwen uh, just last year. Uh, I'll summarise. It was a 46-year-old woman who'd had very stormy dysthyroid eye disease. This was not a cosmetic case. She'd had a thyroidectomy in 2013. That struggled to control her uh, thyrotoxicosis and her um, uh, exophthalmus. She'd had orbital radiotherapy, and she'd had a lot of steroid treatment. Um, but finally, after five years, um, the thyroid eye disease had become quiescent. But she still had very bad bilateral proptosis, so bad on the right side that she was 
uh, committed to wearing a patch permanently, um, but still had quite good visual acuity, less good in the, in the right eye. She also had some other significant comorbidity, uh, but had gone through anaesthetic assessment and the particular problems were that she had some mild anemia, and more particularly she had a mild reactive thrombocytosis, which meant that the uh, anaesthetist who I've worked with for more than 20 years said, you know, it'd be better to give her some fragment, that's low molecular weight heparin, in the uh, post early post-operative period. Um, she's overweight, she's got osteoarthritis, her mobility's quite limited, um, she walks with two sticks. So there were a lot of good reasons to worry about the risk of, of, of DVT. And in a way, I felt it was a case I couldn't, I couldn't get out of. I was concerned about the uh, fragment. But I thought, well, usually these cases don't bleed. She certainly had good indications for um, decompression. You can see that very high volume uh, orb, uh, orbital soft tissue, massive hypertrophy, particularly on the right side of the extraocular muscles. You can see inferior rectus here, how huge it is. And effectively, she, the, the right eye was, uh, was not functioning because she had to patch it. The anatomy seemed fairly favorable. There was no sinus disease. She had a bit of a low cribriform plate, but the ethmoid height was reasonable. The, the greater the ethmoid height, then the bigger propensity to, to decompress into a space. Um, small sphenoid on the, on the right, large sphenoid on, on the left. So here's the surgery. Um, this is the left side. Um, usual case of uh, doing a complete anterior to posterior ethmoidectomy up to skull base, defining the lamina papyracea, gently removing the lamina papyracea from anterior to posterior, taking great care not to tear the periorbiter. Uh, if you get a periorbital rupture and anteriorly, it can make it much more difficult for you posteriorly. We also uh, decompress the nasolacrimal duct as well. And in this case, as it wasn't cosmetic, we decompress out to the infraorbital nerve that you see there. And then back to the sphenoethmoid junction, once you get to the hard bone of the orbital apex, and in this case, you can see the optic nerve crest and uh, a slightly dehiscent uh, internal carotid artery. Uh, so that part, it was all, all fairly straightforward. Um, and we did this on both sides. Uh, opened the, the periorbiter widely using a, a FACO knife um, and incised some of the fibrous bands uh, deep to the periorbiter to allow the fat to prolapse, um, but not teasing through any, any fat at all, um, just letting it, it prolapse of its own accord. Uh, and to the right of the picture, you can see the exposed nasolacrimal duct. Um, which I think assists with, with the decompression. So, so in the end, you're left with this on both sides. And you, you, in her case, she got a very good decompression. She had very soft orbital tissue. And on the table, it looked excellent. Um, we sur ended surgery 12.30. Um, in the evening, she was started on treatment with uh, heparin. Uh, I saw her about 5 o'clock, 5.30, and she looked fantastic. And I was almost thinking, you know, you look so good, you could go home. Uh, but I thought, well, there these, obviously there's these other, other issues, the other comorbidity, there was no way she was going to be going home. And then at 8 o'clock that night, she had a sudden severe post-op epistaxis with massive bleeding from the right side, bleeding out both sides, with some uh, hematoma formation. Um, she was treated by a very diligent and able, relatively junior registrar who treated this as standard face and put in uh, two rapid rhinos. I had not put on the operation note anything about do not pack the nose or call me. So the, he managed the bleeding and the patient stabilized. But the next morning, the patient had bilateral severe uh, intraorbital hematomas, 
This is not the case, actually. This is a picture of the internet. And in, in fact, my case is worse than this. The uh, right eyelid swelling was extreme. Uh, and you're thinking, this shouldn't happen, that orbit is decompressed. How can there be an orbital hematoma? Which is, suddenly you're outside your comfort zone. And you're thinking, all the things I would do normally, I would decompress the orbit. Uh, I'd do a lateral canthotomy but I know the orbits are already decompressed. So this is my usual menu for someone with an orbital complication. I phone a friend, our ophthalmology ward is right next to ours, I have a very good relationship with them. Um, we removed the packing straight away, uh, we got the op ophthalmologist along, and we didn't just phone the ophthalmologist, the ophthalmologist was there. Uh, he suggested starting IV dexamethasone. Um, and as we decompressed the orbit, he was happy to let things be. What was interesting in this case is how difficult it was to assess the visual acuity because her lids were so distended. Um, he struggled, and this idea of checking colour vision for the right eye was not an option. Um, we, she could uh, count fingers, no problem with the left eye, and, she, and there was, she had good pupillary reflexes in both eyes. So his view was, you've decompressed the eye, conservative treatment, give her some steroids and see how she gets on. So over the next 24 hours, there was no further bleeding. The left eye improved vastly. She was able to open it. The right eye remained closed. The ophthalmologist advised continued treatment with steroids. Uh, she still, still had reasonable pupillary reflexes. The next day, the, the left eye was even better, but the right eye was worse. She was now complaining of a lot of pain in the right eye. The lid swelling was no better, if not worse. And the right eye was proving very difficult to assess. Uh, so we went on, as you would, and arranged some imaging. And I must say, until this point, I was... Uh, not at a loss, but thinking, what is the differential diagnosis here? Could it be cavernous sinus thrombosis? Is there a retroorbital collection that I've missed that's occurred following the surgery? She had an intraorbital bleed that hasn't decompressed. Am I ha going to have to do a, a, a lateral decompression? So these were the thoughts in my head. This was the MRI scan, which was, was, a, was a huge relief uh, in that it, what it showed is um, massive... Uh, surgical emphysema into the uh, lids and some preceptal hematoma. So the abnormality was all, all preceptal in that she had uh, somehow blown ear and blood during the epistaxis um, into the uh, preceptal orbital tissues, hence the massive swelling. Uh, and I was also told by the radiologist that the decompression had been effective there was a, a, a good, effective decompression, and most importantly, that the optic nerves were intact, and there was there were the, the um, uh, there was no problem with re retroorbital swelling or or hemorrhage. Um, but even after 20 years of doing orbital decompressions, I realised that there, were, there was a fault with my practice, and that I did not have a flight plan for this scenario, and I think it is a problem when we're doing more advanced surgery and we're taking out perimeter walls of the bony box we work in. Um, nasal packing works on a tamponade effect, and as soon as you take a wall out, you take out the medial wall of the orbit, or you take out some of the skull base, and there's a massive hemorrhage in, in the uh, using a tamponade, then that hemorrhage is going to occur into the adjacent cavity, whether it be uh, orbit in this case, or intracranially. So this was my problem. I did not have a flight plan. And the situation could have been a lot worse. Uh, it certainly put my blood pressure up for, for, for two days. And reflecting on it, what, what have I learned from this? Well, I'd, I'd like to think and wonder a bit more whether I had done the operation. I felt somewhat pressurised. I was worried about the reactive thrombocytosis. I'm sure if the patient hadn't had Fragman that um, 
this wouldn't have occurred. It was an absolutely straightforward decompression. There was no problem with uh, a, a, a any significant intraoperative hemorrhage. There was a little bleed from the left opposite side uh, posterior septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery, which we controlled. Um, I think I should have written a more accurate operation note. I think I left the resident in a difficult situation. Um, I, I would state now, don't use packing. Try an absorbable um, Nasopor, posisep, possibly flow seal, although I'm not sure whether that would have worked in this case. Um, and obviously use your friends. I think we could have done the MRI sooner. That would have reduced a lot of uh, anxiety. Um, but I think in the end I would still have to have done the case, given this lady's problems of not having a usefully functioning eye and having to deal with her other, other, other comorbidity. I'm glad I had my, my, my uh, friends available, and if it happened again, what would I do? I might be more, well, with any decompression now, I might be more inclined to pre-pack with absorbables. If I was worried about hemorrhage, I might consider putting a splint in to splint the lateral wall during the, uh, that, that phase, although I don't think I'd do that routinely. And I'd always be ready to do arterial ligation early rather than, rather than pack the nose. Um, and the other thing I learned, which, which I've always tried to make myself be, is uh, um, be honest with the patient. It's, it's hard when you get a, a, a complication like this. You do feel very stressed. You feel very responsible. There was no other team involved in the surgery. It was just me. Um, and there's a a natural tendency to avoid the situation, which you mustn't do. So you've, you've got to treat the patient as, as, uh, as precious, as special, see them more than you need to, inform them, inform the family. Uh, as, as soon as there's a possible bad outcome, keep the patient informed, which, which, which we did. Um, and we were lucky this time. Um, it was an open orbit. There was a bad hemorrhage. Um, there was a terrible orbital hematoma, but there was no loss of vision in the long term. And I'm pleased to say that her, her vision recovered to what it had been um, preoperatively. But uh, my take home message is that there is always something to learn. And I'm still learning. And I'm still a student of endoscopic sinus surgery and will be till, till, until the day I stop operating. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, happy to take any questions. Whiskey. Can you ask for why was the left eye also so It definitely was. And I think it's because both orbits were open. The patient had a right nosebleed um, and was packed. So I'm unless there was a bilateral nosebleed, which doesn't seem usual. So there's been, there's been hemorrhage into both sides, possibly around the back. The, the, the hematoma on the right was much worse. The hematoma on the left uh, was, was significant, but it was never a worry. We could, were always able to assess her vision. Hmm. OR notes? Do you always write? You know, I, I, every time something happens in, in, the night, in the night after surgery, I think next time I'm going to write all the good instructions. And that yeah. usually lasts two weeks. <laughs> and then I don't do it anymore. Did you, did, are you better? Yeah, well, you, you can test me in a year's time. Because this is very recent. It was only like last month. But uh, I do write a very clear post-operative instruction, but uh, I hadn't, like I said, I didn't have a flight plan for this. So I wouldn't write, do not pack the nose. I'm not expecting these cases to bleed. I've never had one bleed before. They're usually very, and especially after, this was eight hours after surgery. You know, with, when the patient was looking so well at 
uh, five hours after surgery that I was thinking, you know, you know, maybe you could go home. And she fell asleep actually, and then w woke up. And I wonder if she sneezed in her sleep or something, but we, we don't know. Yes, there was a question over here. Yes, please, uh, Sayyid al-Sharif from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I have two parts question. First one, uh, I saw you during the operation doing some vertical incisions. Yeah. So is this uh, like uh, the usual case or this is an exception? The other question, would you have been able to take the patient back to OR if you uh, could uh, because the, uh, this is severe bleeding? Well, the, the, the first case, I agree with you that uh, linear periorbit uh, uh, horizontal periorbiter incisions, in theory, put media rectus less at risk. But it depends on the case. In her case, she had um, a, a significant uh, medial floor decompression. And uh, I find it easier to do those with, with, uh, with, with vertical. But it's, it, essentially, what I'm doing is, in that case is a lot of small verticals and then joining them up with a, with a horizontal. Uh, we could have taken this patient back to OR at any time. The, the OR is next, ne next to the ward, and, which is what we would have done if the, if the MRI had shown any retroorbital collection. Then we would have had to probably go on and do a lateral decompression. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. It's interesting that, that you know we, we all have these cases, and the real take-home message is, was crystallised beautifully then by Paul that we all improve, or we we hope we improve as we get older with experience, but we're all learning. And I never, ever stop learning. And I think that's the, the key principle. It was very interesting that, um, to make you feel all optimistic, um, that my wife sent me the headlines from the, a newspaper on the front page of the newspaper today. And the heading was, patients far less likely to die if your surgeon's over 60. <laughs> I'm in the right category now. <laughs> so I'm going to present my case now. Do you want to put the slides on? Um, it, it's something just slightly different um, and a little more light-hearted so that you go home feeling a bit better than the, you probably are now. And I've called it the perfect storm. So I was asked, I've got some very good colleagues in Liverpool and I've got one in particular that, that uh, is, does a lot of skill-based surgery, but she had a difficult sinus problem and she asked me for a second opinion. So it's a, it was a man, 72, had asthma and he'd had really, really difficult sinus disease to control. He'd had previous polyp surgery, previous endoscopic surgery. Um, and he'd actually had a, a, a brain abscess and a craniotomy, uh, and then he'd been admitted not only a few months ago with a severe headache that was thought to be meningitis. And as you can see on that scan, uh, there are craniotomy uh, incisions all over the place and the posterior wall of the sphenoid uh, of the frontal sinus is missing on the left side and so we decided to do it jointly this is nausea my my uh, really good colleague um, and so we thought joint operation uh, we do it together and we admitted him for surgery and we'd use image guidance and inject intrathecal fluorescein so that if we got any defects, we would see them at an early stage in the surgery. Well, the patient came in for surgery, but nausea didn't show up. And I thought, where on earth is she? Because she's normally not late. I rang her up and she was on holiday. 
nobody had told me that she was going to be off. Um, and so I was on my own. But I was completely on my own because there were no junior staff, no trainees. And so I was left having to complete the consent, um, do the WHO checklist, the huddle in the, uh, the early morning at the start of theatre, and knowing that my name would be down for starting late again. <laughs> so there's no way out. I was cornered. Um, so I, I got on, did all the jobs, did the VTE, and we got the show on the road. Um, we've got a very nice brain lab navigation system. Uh, it was relatively new at that stage, and the theatre staff didn't really understand it very well, so I was quite happy to set the whole thing up and, and wire it all up. And so I was setting up the image guidance. Um, at the same time, the patient was in the anaesthetic room and the anaesthetist uh, was doing a lumbar puncture to inject the intrathecal fluorescein. Well, what happened next? Patient, anaesthetized, general anaesthesia, surgeon on the floor, doing the wires, and the operating room starts spinning round quite violently. So that was me with acute vertigo just before I started operating. Um, it's interesting having acute vertigo. I, I thought this must be benign position of a tigo and it'll go off fairly quickly. And it, it was, that's what it ended up being. But I did not anticipate how awful you feel for several hours after the acute vertigo settles. And so I was really not up to operating. And so we simplified the plan. I had a, we had a, a very senior trainee in the other theater, and he came and did the sinus case, but we just kept things simple, didn't push any barriers. And meanwhile, my day with vertigo, well, I was sent off to the Balance Clinic. I was very fortunate the Balance Clinic was running that day. So I was sent off there ten within 10 minutes of the episode. Um, I had a hearing test. At the time, I had long-term tinnitus in the left ear, which I denied for a long time and found that I had a notch at 4K. <laughs> so they sent me um, off for an MRI scan, which I had later that day. Fortunately, the acoustic neuroma that I was intend thought I might have wasn't there, but the mucosal in the frontal sinus was. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always fun discovering about yourself at this time of life. Um, and we have some excellent excellent physiotherapists who, do, who help with the balance service. And I managed to get to see the senior physiotherapist who did Epley maneuvers on me recurrently for a whole hour and then said, keep doing that every hour, right through the day. And the dizziness actually went that day. I only had BPPV for one day. It was amazing how, how it all went away. Um, but that was my day. What about the patient? Well, I did stay in the hospital and I tried to do paperwork um, and it was seven o'clock at night and I just phoned up before going home to find out how the patient was. And nobody told me or fed back any information, but he'd had an epileptic fit. And he, he was supposed to have a, a day case operation, but he'd been kept in. Um, he'd been transferred to the intensive care unit, and from there he'd been transferred to a medical ward on the top floor of the 10th floor of our tower block. So 
I went up to see him and he was pyrexial and very confused. I was thinking, what the heck has gone wrong? Anyway, the diagnosis was that he'd had um, an epileptic fit and he'd aspirated and had developed aspiration pneumonia. And he'd stopped phenytoin from his craniotomy three weeks previously. He'd seen the neurosurgeon, then the neurosurgeon had just said, oh, you don't need that anymore, just stop it. So it was assumed that he'd had an epileptic fit with aspiration due to stopping phenytoin, um, and then he'd, develop, and he'd had a chest infection, developed pneumonia. So, but nobody had actually told me what was going on. Nobody had actually considered, could this be the fluorescein? Had the fluorescein induced an epileptic fit? So I raised this point and I phoned up one of our neurosurgeons and we discussed him over the phone. Um, and so the, di the true diagnosis was it was the fluorescein. But how did all of this happen? Well, normally with the fluorescein injections, I've been working with the same anaesthetist for many years. Um, it just happens like clockwork. Uh, the dosing is all correct. And there's never an issue. On this occasion, completely new, different anaesthetist. The anaesthetist had talked to the usual anaesthetist about two weeks before the patient came in for surgery, and it was a corridor conversation of, oh, I'm supposed to do this, how do I do it? So there was nothing written down, it was all just a verbal communication. Then there was the series of communication problems of me being responsible for the patient, but nobody had actually told me there'd been a problem. And they hadn't actually reached the right diagnosis at the end of the day. Then there was the fact that, as I said, I'd been on my own, under pressure, a bit like Vitska's case where everything was on my shoulders, everyone was trying to time me, to push me, and I'd cut corners. Normally, I consent my own patients in clinic. This was a joint case. I was expecting my colleague to be there. I hadn't consented the patient from word go, and I consent everybody properly if I'm injecting fluorescein. On this occasion, it hadn't happened, and in the heat of the moment, I'd gone through the consent of the operation, but I'd forgotten to do the specific consent for fluorescein. And at this moment, I thought, I'm dead. I can't escape. And then there was the fluorescein itself. It was a, a dose error. The patient had 150 milligrams injected. The maximum dose I would ever use is 50 milligrams. We normally use 30 milligrams. So he'd had a massive overdose of fluorescein that had then induced an epileptic fit, leading to aspiration and a chest infection that kept him in hospital for another week. So it was a multitude of errors all going on at the same time. But I just thought that I'd share that with you to show you how it can all go wrong all so quickly. And you never quite know what's going to happen. The patient did get over it all and he survived and he recovered fully, but it cost him an extra week in hospital. Anyway, thank you all for your attention. I will take questions if there are any. So we've, we've got a question. Yeah? Uh, thank you for this uh, story. Um, what would you do in this uh, case when the fluorescein overdose already happened? How would you clear the CSF or what's your approach to the conservative treatment of this type of thing? Yeah, it's conservative treatment. Um, 
we did discuss whether or not to drain off CSF uh, yeah. and reduce the, the actual dose. But by then, the event has happened. Yeah, so, you know, it's, you're too late. It's the horse has bolted. So you've just got to be supportive to the patient. Uh, but get the right people involved, and which is why I, I included the neurosurgeons and also very senior anaesthetists who could help control the patients should you, you get a, a status asthmaticus type of situation. Thanks. Okay. Any questions for any of the speakers at all? No? Well, I think on that note, I'd like to, to really thank the other speakers for fantastic and open and honest uh, experiences. Um, I think it's been a super session. Of all the great things we've heard during this conference, I'm sure that you will go away and you'll recall these stories. Um, and it may well help keep you out of problems in the future. So thank you all for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. Um, I think as, as the faculty, we, we've really enjoyed having you all here. Uh, it's been one of the most stimulating events I've ever been to. So thank you all very much and safe home. <laughs>